first meeting, oh, sorry, not the first meeting, we've had a lot of meetings, but our first <laughs> workshop of uh, the winter semester, uh, and our first workshop of the year, actually, so I really hope you enjoy it. I've taken a look at Adam's slides, and uh, it looks awesome. Um, he goes over the theories, a lot of practical examples, so um, hopefully you're going to uh, go out today having learned a lot. Um, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to upload it. Um, the, slides will be, the slides will be available near the end. When I'll, there'll be a work thing that you can do, and then I'll upload the, sli the slides there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, uh, so, but today we're still gonna have like uh, you know what, what we do in the usual meetings. So we're gonna have the news roundup, uh, and then we're also gonna have Rick's random uh, week four rundown. Um, and uh, before all of that, I just have a couple of announcements for you, and it'll just it'll just take me two minutes. So for the first announcement, uh, so you know, again, we have a workshop today, but next week we have another workshop on uh, SQL injection and, and cross-site scripting. Um, I've actually taken a look at like what Spencer's put together, and he already has like two sites up. They're already public. I'm not going to tell you how to reach them yet, <laughs> given that they're vulnerable. Uh, but yeah, he has like over like it's something like 12 to 15 exercises, and you're going to be doing them in partners. So next next week it's going to be like super duper interactive. So you know, if you like this one and you want to see more, and you know, next week's going to be like super relevant to security as well, please do come. Um, yeah, so I know that's going to be November 8th, so it's going to be an overview of SQL injection and cross-site scripting. He's also going to go over uh, a little bit, give me one second, uh, over deploying a web app using Docker, and then uh, again, the scenarios that I'll cover with Jeff. Um, I remember the last meeting, you said something about uh, the red teaming one is going to be limited space availability kind of thing. How does it work with all these guys? Like, do you have to sign up all the time? Is that the you don't know. So, so any, any student-led workshop, as many of you uh, as possible can show up. That's cool. Like, I'll try to make sure that there are volunteers there. The intro to right teaming one, again, because it's done by like a very like high-ranking professional, we do have to uh, you know, make sure we constrain the size a little bit just so that it's, it's a good experience. Because I we expect like in excess of 70 to 100 people. Wow. Um, how does it work as far as limitations, like prereqs for signing up? Are you, are you guys going to prioritize people that can utilize the concepts better than others? Or how does it, first come Not first really, serve? no. It's going to be first come, first serve. Um, and I'll make sure I give you the exact time when I'm going to be posting the, the link for it. Okay? Um, yeah, and the second announcement is just our usual announcement. You should do a talk. I'm still looking for a speaker for November 29th. So if you, um, if you would like to speak, you have a project that you want to kind of share with us, um, or you've noticed like a cool trend in the industry, please, you know, come up. Um, you see like everybody's pretty casual here, um, and uh, you know, it's a good way to just kind of practice your public speaking skills, and because if you do it now, you're more likely to do it in the future, um, which is really good. It's a nice way of getting recognized as well in the industry. Okay. And yeah, that's it for me, and on to the news roundup with just me this time. Okay, hi everyone, how's it going? And um, thanks for coming here and not going to Hackfest. <laughs> um, well, I know a lot of our peeps are there right now, so that's great. Uh, I hope they're having fun. Okay, so news for this week. Uh, City of Johannesburg uh, got hit again with ransomware. Um, they got hit uh, a little while back, and I don't think they paid it then. And they're also refusing to pay it this time as well. The hacker is demanding four bitcoins, which, depending on the day, might be $400 or $60,000, but whatever. They want four bitcoins. Um, and the city's saying, no, screw you, we're not paying. What's extra interesting is this time, bad guys also saying, we, in addition to encrypting your stuff, we stole a bunch of data and pay us or we'll release it. Um, so it's kind of neat to see the evolution of these um, sort of data money extortion attacks going from just, we encrypted your stuff to now, hey, we also have sensitive stuff and we're going to release it if you don't pay this ransom. Um, so it's always neat to watch how bad guys sort of evolve their attacks and stuff that way. Um, this hydro company, Norsk, which I believe is in a country um, where I, uh, here we go, Norway based, that makes sense, um, suffered some kind of cyber breach or attack and they filed with their insurance provider. Um, so to build on one of the long term stories we had a couple of meetings ago about breach insurance and cyber insurance and stuff like that. And unfortunately, out of what they estimate is $71 million worth of damages that the company suffered as a result of the attack because of downtime and repairs they had to do and new systems they had to bring up, their insurance only paid out $3.6 million. Um, so again, the cyber insurance market is something that's still evolving. Um, and, you know, maybe 
there were terms and conditions that should have been in their contract that they didn't have, or maybe they were in violation of stuff that led to not the full amount being paid out. Um, but if you're ever in a position where you're making these kinds of decisions, you really need to go through some exercises and figure out what is this policy going to pay us out if we suffer a breach? Um, does it depend on the kind of breach and things like that? Um, if anybody's played this untitled goose game, uh, where you're just playing like a jerk goose that steals stuff. Um, it's cool. A lot of people really jumped onto it and started playing it. It's really funny. Um, the best part is when like the infosec industry gets in really into a game because then within a few days somebody's like reversed it and tried looking for vulnerabilities, which is obviously uh, a thing that's happened. And they found out that you could make a malicious kind of custom save file for the game. And then if you gave it to one of your friends and they go to load this same save file in the game, um, it broke the the application's attempt to parse and rebuild your game from that save file and then it took over the process and then exploded and sort of took over stuff so yeah um let's just save files are a thing game game security is like a side interest of mine i think it's really cool because games are super super insecure what yeah i know right freaking freaking goose um so yeah yeah they patched it but still it's out there um this one was interesting. So the National Health Service in England has a really outdated kind of legacy pager system that they use to send messages back and forth between people and systems and stuff like that. And uh, an amateur radio person was recording a bunch of these and basically decoding them into human readable messages. And they had them sort of flashing up on like a webcam stream that they had. Um, the person's ISP said, yo, you have this unsecured webcam. You should take it down. They were like, oh yeah, totally, I'm gonna do that. Um, but in the meantime, the sort of radio control agency in the UK found out about this and is potentially going to charge this person um, because in the UK it's it's not illegal to just operate um, a radio receiver like that and to do your own kind of decoding on generic messages stuff that's meant for the public but it's against the law there to intercept messages that aren't explicitly public or that are not meant for you um, and these ones while they could sort of read them out of the air and decode them and read them, they were not explicitly meant for that person and they were on a non-public channel. They were on the National Health Services pager channel. So in theory, it was against the law. It's a tricky thing though because there's a lot of signals that are just broadcast and openly available. It's the equivalent of like hopping on your neighbor's open and exposed Wi-Fi and using it for a bit. Did you have explicit permission to hop on their Wi-Fi and use it? Probably not, um, but a lot of people say, well, they left it open, so it probably meant I could read it. Well, that's not always the case. Sometimes people don't know better. Sometimes maybe a system is just old and hasn't been replaced with something newer and more secure. So even just intercepting communications, depending on the situation, can be illegal sometimes, so watch out. Um, this one was really interesting. So if you have an Amazon account um, and you buy things on Amazon, like a lot of people do, uh, you can add and give permissions to various devices that can run Amazon clients. And those devices can be authorized under your account to buy stuff. What's really interesting though is apparently some devices don't show up in your list of authorized devices if they're pretty simplistic or they're using a certain like third party app and stuff like that. So what happened is some bad guy um, used or found some sort of exposed or breached credentials for some person who had an Amazon account. The bad guy added their, their own smart TV to the victim's account when they checked the list of devices on the account, they didn't see Bad Guy's smart TV there, but then Bad Guy was able to use their own smart TV to then use this person's account to buy stuff. So the person was seeing transactions, but they couldn't see what device it was coming from, so they couldn't shut it down. They had a lot of trouble basically booting or disconnecting the device because you couldn't see the device. You couldn't say disconnect or unassociate this device with my account. And if it's one of those things where it stays logged in for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, even if the person changed their password, wouldn't matter because that TV device was still logged in and had an active session going on. And they said it took them quite a while to really work with Amazon on figuring this out and eventually getting this account um, disconnected and booted. So um, a really interesting kind of edge case thing there. Um, so a while back, we know that Uber got, uh, or Uber was the victim of a data, data breach. What was interesting is the attackers actually tried to extort money out of Uber um, to get them to not report and disclose the data that they'd found in the breach, or basically not to um, sort of expose all the data that they'd stolen. Um, the two people that did that were found and charged and are now being um, asked to pay a lot of money. So, yeah. um, 
So malicious Android apps, because they keep happening. This one was interesting. It was like a really emoji-based keyboard app that I guess was really popular on the Google Play tool. But what happened is when you downloaded it, in the background, it was also making little transactions on websites, like tiny ones that won't hopefully be big enough to, for people to notice, but it would just rack up money on people's Google Play accounts. And apparently the people that released this managed to score like $18 million because it was a really popular keyboard app and they were just making tiny transactions in the background. Um, yeah, sketchy stuff. Um, Google Chrome was found to have a, an actual vulnerability being exploited in the wild. Um, this is interesting when we find out about these. Oftentimes these days when we hear about vulnerabilities and, and them being patched, it's because researchers have found them and disclosed them and we get to find out about what it was and luckily, hopefully, it had never been exploited in the wild. The odd time though, it goes the other way where we hear about actual breaches and exploitation happening um, and then they kind of reverse whatever happened and then um, find the vulnerability from there and then go patch it. So somebody had found what's called a use after free vulnerability in Google Chrome and had some malware or some attacks that was leveraging that. Um, use after free vulnerabilities are common vulnerabilities in languages like C that do their own kind of memory management where you can basically, um, without getting into it too much, uh, in C, we can dynamically allocate ourselves a whole bunch of memory, and then when we let it go, we're not supposed to refer to that memory anymore. If you do, that's called a use after free vulnerability because you don't necessarily know what kind of memory you will be referring to later on. Um, someone's creating fake uh, voicemail emails, essentially, and sending them to executives via Office 365. So the idea is you're getting an email that says, hey, you have a voicemail, please um, log into our voicemail system and check your voicemail. Um, and these are pretty common. I mean, there's a lot of automated voicemail utilities out there, but now really it's just um, stealing credentials and stuff like that when people are doing that. Um, they're mostly going after, again, executives and people with a lot of money. Um, so watch out for fancy phishing. Uh, apparently Bed Bath & Beyond had a breach. That's like a lot of bees, which is amazing. Um, a uh, number, like a bunch of mil like millions of uh, customer kind of shopping details apparently got exposed um, because of this. Um, they're referring to the breach without too much detail, but they're referring to it as a supply chain attack, meaning either some software tool or some vendor or some third party um, that is used within Bed Bath & Beyond's technology stack got compromised and that let someone into their systems that way. Um, apparently China is uh, or a hacking group associated with China has been um, basically breaking into ISPs and reading text messages and searching them for contents related to like political dissidents, which is, we know, a thing that they like to do because they like to kind of clamp down on that. Um, so yeah, uh, unencrypted text messaging is always uh, a problem. Um, this is one of the reasons why we tell everybody, you know, all of your text messages and emails and stuff like that should be encrypted because if someone can break into your ISP or some other path in your communications channel, um, they can read your stuff. So view signal or some encrypted chat app signals better. Um, a solar and wind power company um, had a bit of an attack. Um, still not sure if it was meant to actually target this company, if it was just somebody running scripts or tools or whatever. Um, but what was happening is this power company was using a bunch of firewalls that had a known vulnerability. The vulnerability just allowed somebody to keep resetting the firewalls, basically just running denial of service attacks on this power company. Um, not great, <laughs> definitely not great when you can kind of DOS power companies. Um, this is interesting, the FTC or the Federal Trade Commission, I think, maybe, sort of, yeah. Blue eyes nodding, so I'll take that as a yes. Um, is a body in the US that can control uh, like a lot of things you can and can't do um, with regards to trade and selling and doing stuff. But anyways, they banned um, a company called Retina X um, from basically selling this stalkerware tool that they had. Stalkerware is um, software that people can use to spy on exes and spouses and people that they want to keep an eye on. Um, the company was found to be engaging in some pretty bad practices like leaving a lot of the data that their tools were collecting exposed to the internet. So not only could some like, you know, malicious ex-partner stalk you, all of the data that they were collecting on you was also publicly exposed. So they basically, um, the FTC went after them and said, no, you can't do this no more, you can't sell that tool. So that's good. Uh, Microsoft is coming out with a new sort of stack of technologies to try to secure 
um, more of the hardware and firmware in computing environments because there's been a lot of firmware and low-level vulnerabilities recently. So they're kind of discussing this um, series of techniques that they have to ensure greater uh, integrity essentially over the firmware and boot process of your machine to prevent lower level exploitation techniques. There's a lot of different technologies working here um, and at play. It's just more of a general announcement from Microsoft saying, yeah, we recognize that, you know, yeah, up in like user land software space, yeah, stuff goes wrong, but we want everything down below that to be really solid, really secure. You want to be confident that whatever operating system you're booting is just stable, nothing's going to go wrong. So that's cool. It's nice to see them focusing on that. Um, yeah. Uh, just, I don't know, because surveillance stuff is always interesting to talk about. Um, I guess because of the fear of a lot of the school shootings, um, the U.S. Uh, school system has been upping a lot of their surveillance technology on students. There's all kinds of studies that talk about the impact to people when they know that they're under constant surveillance and what this does to kids in addition to them being constantly, I guess, on edge about the... the um, instances of school shootings and stuff. Um, just to add that layer of it, uh, it like it's it's a tough it's a tough sell. Um, uh, so yeah, just it's there because it was an interesting story uh, about surveillance. It's a sick graphic. It's awesome. Um, so this one apparently in Europe, this like drug trafficking group um, was their own telco essentially. Um, so in a lot of like clubs that they were talking about, um, you can go and from sketch individuals buy like you know you know like burner phones and custom um, smartphones and cell phones for engaging in whatever kind of illicit activity you want. Um, and the actual like ISP or telco that was running this was actually one of the drug gangs. Um, someone found out because the phone that they bought and they were using was owned by one of these gangs. So kind of an interesting story that's tangentially related to cyber because like who's running the technology that you rely on? It's always an interesting question to ask. Uh, this is neat. Um, so Alexa and Google Home, um, people have found out that some third party apps that they had installed into these personal home assistant devices were listening for passwords and credentials and things like that and trying to access that data. It's not that the, the base Alexa and Google Home we're listening for credentials and stuff. It's that into these products, you can install third-party developed apps. And it was those apps that are coming from maybe an untrusted application ecosystem uh, that were engaging in kind of snooping um, behavior. So like we're seeing with smartphones and, and all these kinds of smart devices that allow you to install third-party apps, you really got to be cautious of who that third-party app is coming from. This is, it's turning out to be a pretty big challenge in these smartphone and I guess IoT industry, right? Like you want to enable people to publish whatever they can in, in the Google Play Store or in the, um, in the App Store with Apple because there's cool things that have happened because people can just publish stuff. But at the same time, you really have to keep a close eye on what's a good app, what's not a good app. And sometimes stuff slips through the cracks. Um, apparently NordVPN suffered a data breach. They are a really popular VPN service. Um, they're claiming that the uh, breach happened because there was a, like a long-term account that had been left open and connected to their services that didn't need two-factor authentication and someone compromised the uh, login credentials for that account and got in uh, that way uh, and then accessed a bunch of their other systems. And it's scary when someone can get into a VPN service like that because then they can start you know, recording all that traffic that's not supposed to be ever captured or saved um, because people use VPNs for sensitive stuff like watching pornography or other stuff, I don't know. Um, oh yeah, and then so basically after they got called out like, hey, we think you were breached, Nord's come out and said, okay, fine, so we're gonna do like pen testing audits, we're gonna have like ephemeral RAM only servers where nothing's persistent anymore, um, trying to sort of regain some of that consumer trust because really VPN companies are all about the consumer trusting that they're you know doing their job in terms of securing or encrypting their communications, not keeping logs and things like that. Um, I, for one, have noticed that like the instances of NordVPN advertisements on like um, the various services I use have gone way, way up. I'm getting bombarded with NordVPN advertisements. Maybe they had a lot of clients drop them after that breach happened. I don't know, because why else would you crank your advertising unless to maybe try to drown out some of the news of the breach? Well, most people buy VPN at a monthly or yearly subscription. Yeah. They'll only see it when people start renewing. They'll really start seeing it when people start renewing. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So I mean, maybe they'll, it'll be a while before they know if. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. 
Um, this is an interesting one. Australia's been in the news a little, a little bit recently because they were like pushing things like weakened or backdoored crypto um, implementations and things which we are pretty against. This one's interesting though. So um, one of their legislators has proposed this idea that you need to sign into porn sites using facial recognition um, to, I guess, prove that you're like old enough to go to the site. So, I mean, I don't know. People are going to be like painting older looking faces on mannequin heads really, really quickly to bypass that, I'm sure, because that's what people do. Um, yeah, basically verify age before visiting sites. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, to build on a couple of stories we had the other week, um, where we were talking about people being either for or against DNS queries over HTTPS. As a reminder, DNS basically being like the phone book for the internet, right? I want to know a website's address, I look it up or by issuing a DNS query. And traditionally, those queries have been unencrypted, so anybody can see which websites you're asking for the IP address to. Um, one of the new protocols attempting to encrypt this is DNS over HTTPS, where we make secured website-style requests for DNS data. Um, Chrome is now building this into um, this capability into Chrome. Um, there's also a couple other browsers that are uh, like Firefox that are going to have it in by default as well. And a lot of people were worried that uh, that would prevent a lot of network security monitoring that we do because we rely on being able to read people's DNS requests because malware often makes unencrypted DNS requests to its command and control servers and we like to know when that's happening. So that's the concern from the security side. Um, but the Chrome devs are saying, don't worry, it's not going to break everything. We'll figure out a way to use this properly. Um, also, the ISPs aren't happy about it because they can no longer inject your DNS traffic with their own DNS servers and replace the ads on the websites with their own advertisements, which is something that they have done for a long time. Um, so they don't like that they um, can't modify your DNS queries anymore either. Surprising. Um, if you've been following uh, computer architecture the last couple of years, you may have noticed that recently there's been a lot of bugs in the speculative execution engines of um, CPUs. So this is the part of the CPU that tries to figure out very probably what piece of code is going to run next and tries to make your computer run faster by calculating um, some of those branches and some of those possibilities ahead of time for you. And people proved that you can inject basically bad data in there and change how a program was behaving. Um, there's a whole series of bugs related to that, like Spectre and Meltdown and a number of others. Um, one Linux kernel dev saying, fine, you know, for the next little while until we get this straight, you should probably just turn off hyper-threading in your Intel CPUs. That's the dumbest suggestion I've ever heard because you know how slow our machines would get if we just turned off hyper-threading? I mean, I get where they're coming from. They're saying if you absolutely need to, for it to be secure and to prevent these type of speculative execution bugs, you need to do this. Fine, maybe there's like a handful of people in the world that need that level of security where you're willing to sacrifice that level of performance. Um, but that's a suggestion. <laughs> no, you still have to take, you just need to learn how single threaded execution works. It's way easier. Um, the country, not the state, of Georgia uh, had one of their ISPs attacked and it basically resulted in a pretty uh, large uh, sort of out, uh, outage, I guess, of the internet across their country. Um, because I guess a lot of services, a lot of companies, a lot of um, technology in their company was basically leveraging one major ISP. That's the danger of centralizing things in the internet. It's not that there was only one ISP in the country, but I guess there was one really big popular one, and when they went down, a lot of stuff went down with it. Um, so yeah, just uh, it's, it's a danger of relying too heavily on one service. The internet was designed initially to be a very um, self-healing, self-rerouting around damaged areas type system. And actually, with things like certain web serv services being the only ones to offer DNS over HTTPS and like, you know, any kind of uh, ISP monopoly that we see kind of defeats that initial purpose of the internet. Um, even with like everyone running all their stuff on Amazon, whenever Amazon or whenever AWS has an outage, you notice large chunks of the internet go down, like, you know, Twitter and Discord and like eight other services will go down because Amazon had an outage in one data center, right? So it's something that we're still trying to struggle with, right? We want the internet to be decentralized, diverse, but at the same time, you know, you have companies vying for market share and all that good stuff. Um, there's Italian, an Italian bank or credit union or something like that called Unicredit, and they had their third breach in three or four years. After investing um, like 
two point something billion um, euro in cybersecurity controls. So they spent a lot of money and they still had a data breach. So it goes to show you that money alone does not fix this problem. You really need to make sure it's done right. Now the most recent data breach occurred because someone basically just like had a bunch of data either via a laptop or documents or something like that and just lost them in public. So like the best security systems in the world aren't going to prevent that, right? So um, just a, a really good example of why you can dump loads of money into a security program and if you don't cover all of your bases or at least make sure you're covering simple things like that, you're still going to have data breaches. Um, someone found some interesting vulnerabilities in Facebook um, that allows, you know, um, worse stalkery activity to happen. So they kind of walk, the article walks you through an interesting scenario. So someone splits up with an abusive ex-partner and then the person blocks the ex and changes their own name. Okay. They showed that the, like the, um, the ex-partner was able to open up previous chat conversations in Facebook and it would actually show the victim's new name in those chat conversations because I guess it was updating the name. Um, even though they were blocked, even um, they could just open up their historical chat records and it would show the new name. They also showed that if the, the abusive uh, person went to the like download my data option that the Facebook and a number of other websites offer, um, when they downloaded the data, it would list all of their historical friends and stuff like that. It would list the abused partner's new name um, as a person who they used to be um, you know, linked to through Facebook. So kind of finding those indirect routes to uh, f determine the person's new name on Facebook, um, despite the fact that the person had also been blocked, was kind of interesting. Um, hopefully um, they've patched those bugs. Um, the Pwn to Own contest, which is a really popular um, exploitation uh, event, if you want to call it, where basically groups of hackers get together and they show off certain types of vulnerabilities that they've been researching and they run exploits and get paid big money if they can get the crown jewels of exploiting, which is like, you know, remote exploitation of an iPhone and stuff like that. They're now branching out and they're adding a new part to this event to cover ICS industrial control systems and SCADA, so SCADA stuff. So this would be like, you know, your, your water plants, your power plants and all that kind of stuff. Um, because that area of security is finally getting the attention it needs and they want teams of professionals out there finding these really dangerous bugs that could take down power plants and stuff. Um, and they will be offering huge rewards um, for uh, teams that come and, and do that work. So that's great. Um, as for some smaller software stuff, um, there was apparently a remote code execution bug found in PHP on Nginx web servers. So PHP being a really popular language to write simple web apps in. Um, basically what happened is they found a vulnerability in a module that the Nginx web server uses uh, called PHP FPM. Basically speeds up the processing of your web scripts. Um, a lot of people do use it, even though it's not on by default, it's really popular because it makes PHP stupid fast. Um, and they found out a way that you could get remote code exploitation if someone was using that because just a, a problem with one of the ways that Nginx interprets a, an instruction. So yeah, not great. Um, so patch if you run a server like that. Um, one, two, three, four, five, five, six is apparently a really common password for a bunch of GPS trackers out there, so that's not great. And usually the trackers are easy to enumerate because they just have numeric IDs, so you can just start searching for GPSs with any kind of sequence number and then trying one, two, three, four, five, six as a password, and you can start following things around. You don't know what you're following, but you can follow it, like this person's cute dog. Um, this one's cool. A self-driving car company just open sourced a tool called FW Analyzer. It's meant for doing like security analysis on firmware images to make sure that it hasn't been like backdoored and exploited and stuff like that, which is really cool. It's on GitHub. It's right there. Um, if you want to go check it out, here's the, the links in the, in the news link that's on Pastebin that we tweeted and that we posted in Discord. I didn't post the news link in Discord. I will do that. Sorry. Um, and the last one, um, someone shared this really awesome resource on Twitter this morning, and I just, I, it's not a news story, but I super had to call it out because it's really cool. It's at a website called security4startups.com. It was actually put together, by, I guess, by a venture capital firm to help new startups get all of their checkboxes checked off for cybersecurity requirements, but it ends up being a really great intro checkbox. If you look over at the top here, there's a controls checklist, and it's basically like a printable or usable on the web, really great checklist of high level security controls that should be in place at a technology uh, related startup, which is like, it's what an amazing resource to give to a company that says, hey, what should we be doing for cybersecurity? Because these are all like not, it's somewhere in between like muggle language and nerd language. Like, 
prevent unauthorized access to endpoints and mobile devices by enabling password protected, uh, protected screen lock after inactivity timeout. With some Googling, somebody at, at a tech-related startup can figure that out, right? Um, and there's a whole bunch of these other ones in there. So that's, that's great. Um, it's a cool resource. I'm definitely going to use that myself. That's it for the news. Yay. Um, and now a really quickly run to, rundown of software code repo. I'll just go right into it, unless anybody needs a break. You probably don't, because why would you? OK. So uh, we're going to read some code. So this week, uh, I chose a tool called Paste Hunter, which basically lets you um, constantly pull and search a number of pastebin-like sites uh, for th stuff that's been posted. And you can scan it for uh, or with a series of Yara rules. Okay? So the idea, it's Python 3 program, and it collects data from like, publicly pasted sites like GitHub Gists, GitHub Projects, Pastebin, and a few others that, that are listed here. And it scans them for Yara rules. What's Yara, if you haven't used it? Um, it's a tool developed by VirusTotal that lets you describe a signature for something potentially malicious. And then we can use this as a pattern match or a pattern finder or a search tool to search through text to report back findings to us. Okay? So the idea is what um, Paste Hunter itself does. It takes a whole ton of these Yara rules and scans these paste sites. Um, for matches. So in the hopes of finding somebody publicly sharing malware or anything else that would trigger a uh, Yara rule, which is kind of cool. Um, so currently, um, stuff, uh, websites that Paste Hunter supports, Pastebin, um, GitHub Gists, GitHub Selexi, which I don't know, and Stack Exchange, which is kind of cool um, because people will post like malicious code on Stack Exchange, <laughs> I guess. Um, Pastebin makes sense because people um, often share like bots and malicious programs on there. Um, the format, by the way, for a Yara rule, if you want to know, um, basically here, for example, they're defining a sequence of strings. Two of them are represented as um, hex strings, like hexadecimal bytes, and this one's just a plain text string. Maybe that's like some base 64 encoded data or whatever. And the idea is you say, I want this rule to trigger when you see this or this or this as a rule inside some block of text. Um, and here's some metadata about the rule, so you can say you know, some description of it that you could put into something. It's a really cool tool. Um, uh, so, Paste Hunter, the actual thing that we're talking about, though, um, can output to a, a number of different formats, like into an Elasticsearch text database, or send you emails. It can dump stuff into Slack. It'll just spit out files like in JSON, CSV, or send to Syslog, which is cool. Um, it can also take the file that it found and dump it into malware analysis engines, like automated tools like CuckooBox and Viper, which is really cool. Uh, like CuckooBox, basically, you feed it in a malicious program, and it will run it through, like it will attempt to emulate and run that malicious program and give you a report um, based on like what the malicious program tried to do, which is kind of cool. So the repo itself is organized like this. There's a whole ton of YAR rules up here in this folder called YAR rules. Um, there's a bunch of modules and inputs that describe how this program can scan websites like Pastebin and GitHub. There's the outputs modules, which tell the program basically how it writes to CSV or JSON or into an elastic DB or whatever. Post-processing is doing stuff like sending you emails and cleaning up the data. Um, the sandboxes module is for things like Cuckoo Box and Viper to emulate the, um, the program. There's only like one actual main file. <laughs> this common.py file has one function in it, and it's to parse the configuration file. It, I don't know why they broke that out into its own file, but they did. And the main app is um, pastehunter.py, and the GitHub repo also has, I wish the slide thingy would go away, um, but there's a sample config file uh, contained in the... Uh, yeah, it supports Docker, I guess, component as well? Yep, yep, which is cool. You can um, basically run it as a Docker program. Um, so uh, how does pastehunter work? So if we open up pastehunter.py, First off, yay, it's Python 3. I'm glad people are starting to use Python 3. There's a butt ton of libraries being imported here. Um, just as a kind of side note, something we haven't really mentioned before, if you're reading code, if you're trying to get into things like reverse engineering or even just reading other people's code, one of the first steps you should always do is see what libraries is this program using. If we find out what libraries a program uses, we can infer a lot of the things it's probably going to be doing or a lot of the behaviors it's going to be taking. So for example, I listed some here, like it uses Python's OS, Sys, JSON, Hashlib, and logging libraries. Maybe it's doing some file handling, maybe it's doing some stuff on the file system. It's also using multiprocessing queue and signal. Those are all for multiprocess, multi-threaded job control. So we know that this thing is operating in some kind of multiprocess mode, so maybe for efficiency reasons. 
Um, and it's also using the library's URL lib and requests. These are libraries in Python that go out and fetch content from the internet. Right, so from there, we could probably infer quite a bit of behavior, like are, are they going out to those paste sites on the internet, grabbing data, putting them into some queue, and then having a bunch of batch jobs process those and spit out things in JSON? Maybe, we're probably gonna see them. Um, but so there, there's benefit to actually reading the imports in a program. It can tell you a lot of what's probably gonna happen. Um, this is boring, it's just setting up logging. I'm not gonna cover this, um, but basically it just defines a bunch of log levels and logging to files and stuff, because it's always important to have logging in a, in a program. Um, so the first thing that happens in the actual program, uh, it parses the config file. So basically it just opens up a JSON style configuration file and reads out information like this. Here, for example, is the configuration info for this thing to read from pastebin. So um, pastebin mode has been set to enabled. That's the path to the actual um, pastebin Python file that they have in this project that um, reads from pastebin. Um, the URLs for pastebin's API for reading data. Um, they've included like a throttling variable here so that you're not pulling down too much data and get flagged or blacklisted from pastebin. Um, and store all basically just won't force all the data to be stored, it's weird. Um, the output configuration, for example, um, there's outputting to JSON files, outputting to comma separated value files. So basically the config file just says if you want these things turned on or off, gives you some URLs if you need them, and then tells you where the Python programs are that support those modules. Um, after it's kind of done all the config parsing, the program then goes and actually loads those dynamic modules. This part I highlighted and called out for you because if you've ever been writing some code and you want to know how to build yourself your own plugin system, um, these are basically like the four lines of code you need to build a plugin, plugin capability to any program you, you're writing. So if you want to build your own plugins and some software tool you're making, that's what you do. So there you go, I called it out for you. Um, but that's what it does. It goes and it reads all those input and output modules and dynamically loads them like this. Now you have dynamically loadable code. Then it goes into the Yara rules um, that are in that directory. So those are all those pattern matching rules. And it basically just creates a gigantic list of them by opening up the Yara files and then reading through them and building this huge index of individual rules that it's gonna run. Um, one of the things it did import earlier uh, was the Yara library, so basically um, it feeds these rules into like a Yara agent that just knows now how to scan blocks of text for all of the Yara rules. After it loads all the rules, um, then we get into the sort of main chunk of the program. So here we have a queue and we have a list of processes. The queue is going to hold the URLs that we want to fetch data from. So like all of the new pastebin pastes that have been created, all of the new GitHub gists that have been created, those are all gonna live in a great big queue. So imagine this thing's just a huge list of URLs. Then we're gonna have five processes that list live in this little list called processes. Each one of these processes is going to read URLs from this queue, go to the internet, fetch that URL, and then scan all that data for those Yara rules. That's basically how this program works. So here, um, the program spins up those five worker processes, and each of those worker processes runs a function called paste scanner, okay? Um, and it keeps them running. They had this weird method down here for like, I guess sometimes these things freeze or halt, maybe if there's a bad internet connection or something breaks. Um, so what they do is basically they just search for any paused or stalled processes, they, they delete it or kill it, and they just spin up a new one. So that's how they kind of keep this pool of five processes working all the time. Um, so like I said, each of those processes runs a little program called paste scanner or a function called paste scanner. Um, paste scanner just checks the queue of URLs. If it's empty, it waits for a half a second and then checks again. Uh, if it's not empty, it will read a value out of that queue and call it paste data. Um, it's basically a URL. Then the program goes off and basically fetches that URL, um, which is this line I've underlined right here, where it says requests.get raw paste URI, that's the URL that we've read out of the queue. Requests.get just means do an HTTP request, as in like go to the web page. And where it says dot text, this means literally give me all the raw HTML that was on that page, like everything, and dump it into this variable called raw paste data. 
Um, after that, we run the Yara rule matcher on raw paste data, and we run all the rules that we had. So this is the part that I wonder could maybe be improved a little bit. Like this part itself could maybe be multi-threaded again, because running all of these rules on all of the raw HTML data doesn't seem very efficient to me. It's probably a bunch of like text you're searching that you didn't have to check. Like, why not just grab all the text between the body tags of the HTML page? Why are we scanning like the headers and the footers and all the like JavaScript and CSS and maybe other stuff that might have come from the page? We don't know, right? Um, so there's maybe some efficiency that could be kind of worked on here, but whatever. It's, it basically does a bunch of text matching on all that raw data for all the rules that we loaded earlier. Um, when it finds matches, it grabs some of that metadata from the Yara rules. Remember I, when I was showing you a Yara rule, there was like a description and a rule name and stuff like that. It grabs that metadata and loads it into a little list called results. Um, it then basically spits out, or it does some post processing and cleanup if you have the post processing turned on. So if you want to fire off emails, this is where it's going to do it. Again, it's going to load those post processing modules dynamically and do that for you if you want it. Otherwise, um, yeah, it's gonna, it also just stores that data. Uh, right, and this is the part where uh, we read out all of the, uh, sorry, my bad. I'm um, going back, so we, we grabbed the data from the page, we did all the parsing. Um, while those engines, while those processors are fetching all those URLs, this other part of the program is actually going out to the websites and saying, hey, are there any new pastes on Pastebin? Are there any new git gists on GitHub? So this part is actually just reading lists of new URLs to go read later on. So that's what's happening here when it says um, i.recentpastes, um, and then it's adding stuff to the queue for consumption by those worker processes. This is neat. Um, this recent pastes function, um, every one of the input methods we support, so GitHub and Pastebin and those other websites, all of them have a function called recent pastes that describe how we read data from that page. So it's kind of polymorphic, well, it's a bit of overloading in a way if you've done object-oriented programming. Um, how does the actual um, fetching from Pastebin work? So um, like I said, there's one of these in all of the input modules. So we'll have a look at the one for pastebin.py, which is in that directory. Um, basically, it just reads the config data for pastebin from out of our configuration file. Um, and then it does another one of those requests.get to the pastebin URI, basically saying, hey, um, show me any new pastes you had, and just fetches lists of URLs as raw text. Um, after that, it builds a great big dictionary of all the new pastes on Pastebin, um, and the, the format of that is basically file name and some dates and IDs and the URL that's gonna be scanned, and then this gets fed into that queue for consumption by all the workers. Um, for funsies, I wrote like a high-level operation of the program, so if you were gonna go through this yourself and you kinda get stuck on what's happening, basically, we load all the, dynamically load all of the inputs we're willing to accept, as in which websites can we talk to, all of the output methods we want to support, so like CSV, JSON, Elasticsearch, database, whatever. We scan and populate a whole ton of YAR rules. We repeatedly query our input sources that we imported, like Pastebin and GitHub and stuff, for new pastes, and we add those to a great big queue. And then we have five worker jobs that are constantly reading entries from that queue, going off to those websites and fetching all that raw paste data that we then scan for YAR rules, if anything matches, we spit it to any of the output methods that we have had defined. Again, out to files, out to a database, out to wherever. That's how this program works, and it's really cool. Um, you, if you wanted, you could add new sources of input to this program. So if, say like a new version of Pastebin comes along that a lot of people are starting to use. All you would have to do is go into the inputs directory on this in this program, create a new input module like this pastebin one, and you just have to write one function, and it's that um, this one. You just kind of have to overload or override a function called recent pastes um, and describe how you talk to that particular website. And once you've done that, your the program will automatically start incorporating new pastes from that website as well. So it's pretty easy to add um, or to expand on this program by by adding that functionality. So that's it. That's the repo. Um, yeah, that's up on the thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, there's like a Yara library that basically builds like a little parser for you that will like read rules and then tell you if text matches a Yara rule or not. Yeah. And the other thing, I'm just curious, why did they choose to do like multi-processing versus like multi-threading? 
Mm, great question. Um, Python has historically not dealt well with multi-threading. It's really good at multi-processing, but in multi-threading, if you're going to use anything that's heavily I.O. bound, uh, it's I.O. bound or CPU bound? One of the two. Um, Python's not great at because of how Python's global interpreter lock works, meaning it's hard to spin up new instances if you're doing a certain type of processing. Um, so that's why when you see heavily multi-programmed stuff in Python, it's usually multi-process. Um, yeah, you can multi-thread, you just need to be aware of the type of work you're doing, because one type works really well, the other type doesn't. Yeah, that's why. Any other questions? Awesome, thank you. All right, and I'll pass it on to Adam for the workshop. Thank you. Um, and if you're watching on the stream, um, we're not going to be streaming the workshop because it's going to be very sort of a hands-on thing. So I'm going to turn off the stream now, but I heard Adam's going to share his slides. So if you want to go read about Git, then go do that for the benefit of those on the YouTubes.